Hello, and welcome to my talk. I'm Alex. I'm here today to talk to you about reverse engineering in Apple World. I wish we could meet at an actual conference, but this year being as crazy as it is, I'll take this instead. Uh, I hope you enjoy the video. Um, I'll be available for questions uh, later on after the, the talk or uh, on Twitter or whatever. You'll find more information on the slides. Enjoy. All right, so first of all, uh, let me tell you who I am. My name is Alex Repti. You'll find me on Twitter as A Repti and on other services, probably using the same name or Alex Repti. Uh, I'm located in Bremen, Germany, and I work as a Mac engineer at Sketch. Um, I've been doing this iOS and macOS professionally since about 2008. I started as a hobbyist a little earlier than that, but 2008 is when I started to make this my day job, back when the iPhone SDK came out. Uh, and fun fact, I won, or I, I'm part of the team that won the NS Hipster Pub Quiz in 2013 in Amsterdam. Now, um, if you've seen the name of the talk, you're probably wondering if this is for you or not. Um, so I aimed this talk at engineers who are focused on Apple technologies, um, basically all skill levels. If you just started or if you've already been at this for about 10 years, you might get something out of this. Um, it is meant for people with little to no prior experience with reverse engineering. So if you already have a lot of experience with the reverse engineering, this is not going to be the depth that you're looking for because the format is really limited and we don't have that much time. Um, I do have a list of further reading at the end though, so maybe you'll get something out of it anyway. Now, why reverse engineering? Um, you might have heard the term before, even if you have no uh, deeper experience with the reverse engineering. And the, the term reverse engineering basically means, at least for me, I can learn more about framework behavior because I get to take it apart and see what happens behind the scenes. This is especially important if you're working with Apple where the frameworks that we're using day to day are closed source and sometimes it's hard to learn a little about how they work internally. Uh, Apple heavily discourages or sometimes even forbids the use of their private APIs. So we can at least try to learn what is happening there. You could also find out how Apple or somebody else implemented anything specific in their apps. Uh, I've done this in the past when I wanted to recreate some of the things that Apple have done for instance, uh, in Xcode. Um, security. This is a often overlooked point that is really, really important and should be at the focus of just about everybody's um, interest here. Basically, if you know how to do reverse engineering, how to look inside of compiled binaries to take them apart and uh, debug them and everything, then you can also look at how security is handled inside. You can see if you're exposing any information inside your apps that you don't want to expose. You can see if your licensing mechanism, for instance, can be easily reverse engineered and cracked. Um, so it's a good idea to also reverse engineer your own things and look, in that, look at them in detail. Finally, you can also confirm that your app does exactly the right thing, the thing that you want it to do. Uh, I've certainly done this in the past when um, in one case I was working on an application which was flagged incorrectly as malware. Uh, one version was, the other wasn't. I could then prove using reverse engineering to the malware company that had the flaw detection that the things that they were flagging were, uh, were in fact doing the exact same thing and their heuristics were simply wrong. So. It's always good to confirm that your app actually does what it what it's supposed to do. And using the compiled code, you can find out exactly what it is it does. And finally, curiosity. Uh, one of the main reasons why I am a software engineer is because I'm really curious about things. I want to learn more. I want to find out what is going on. And uh, it's a it's a really interesting exercise to to read through some of the things that drives the, the frameworks that we use day to day. Now, uh, before we dive in, 
uh, let me give you a little introduction to your assembly language just in case you've never been very exposed to it. Um, it sometimes looks very archaic and hard to understand, but if you get a little used to it, then it's not as complicated as it looks. Um, what is assembly language? Assembly language is basically a low-level programming language, which has a very strong correlation between the instructions in the language and the architecture's machine code instructions, which is why assembly language is very different between, for example, Intel architectures and ARM or Apple Silicon architectures, because the latter is a RISC architecture, reduced instruction um, architecture. So you've often seen a screen like this, um, either because you have a crash or you've made a breakpoint somewhere. Uh, if as soon as your debugger stops in uh, in any part of Apple's frameworks or any part of any other binary framework that you don't have source access to, you are presented with a screen like this. And oftentimes you might be wondering what exactly those things are, what is going on. Um, and you're right; these things are very hard to understand. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to try to step through them one by one because it takes forever to get to the one you're looking for. Um, it's hard to read. It's hard to follow the logic there. Um, and this is not necessarily um, the best way to, to find out what you're looking for. In some ways it might be, but not always. Now, first of all, let's talk about assembly format real quick because there are two formats which have vastly different consequences. There's AT&T and Intel. In AT&T, you're gonna see prefixes before values and registers, such as the dollar sign or the percent sign. In AT&T, the order of um, the instructions is opcode, like move, followed by the source and then the destination. Uh, AT&T is the default on Apple tools. But you can configure your LLDB to use the Intel format. And in Intel, you're not going to see prefixes. And the order is the other way around. This is important. Um, if you actually want to read the assembly, make sure that you're reading the right format because otherwise you, otherwise you might be uh, misinterpreting what exactly is going on there and the order uh, of things. Now, for instance, this looks like, like this. Um, assigning the value 1 to the registrar RAX, which is an Intel register, not an ARM register, uh, would look like this on AT&T. And on Intel, it would look exactly the other way around with a comma in between. So watch out for the prefixes. Those will give you a good clue that you're on AT&T. And again, if you've not set this up in your LLDB init file, there's a very good chance you are on AT&T prefixes if you're working on Apple tools. Now, um, there are tons of assembly opcodes and they differ by CPU architecture. So I'm only gonna show you a real quick overview of a bunch of them. Um, the, the move opcode basically means you move a value from a source to a destination. Like in the example that we just saw, you're putting a value into a register. You can also put one from one register into another one. Um, there's various ways to do it. If you see um, a letter behind the move, like the letter Q, that gives you an indication of what the size is of the value that you're, that you're moving. Um, the CMP opcode means you compare two values. Um, on Intel, this is usually followed by a JE or JNE instruction, which means jump if equal or jump not jump if not equal. Um, on ARM, it's a little different. And then you have basic, basic arithmetic like addition and subtraction, uh, and there's a bunch of other ones. Um, Intel has a lot more instructions than ARM because ARM is a reduced instruction um, architecture. Uh, so if you, if you need a reference, if you're looking through assembly code to try to understand this, um, bookmark these two spots and you can, uh, you, can, you can find out whatever you need real quick. Now, registers. Uh, registers also differ by architecture. And this is sometimes important um, if you set a breakpoint 
in a method, for example, in a framework method that you might not exactly know what's going on, then you might have the um, the need to 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 check the the arguments that are passed into your breakpoint or into the function, or you might want to um, just print everything out. And in that case, it's important to know which register contains what. So the first argument of a function is an objective C land, and thus also um, by by proxy in Swift, the self pointer. Um, this is stored in the RDI register on Intel and in the R0 register on ARM. The second parameter is underscore CMD or command in Objective-C, which is the selector that is being invoked. Um, on Intel, RSI, on ARM, this is the R1 register. And then we continue. The, the parameters as they're passed into your method, for example, let's say you have UIView set frame, the, the first parameter for your method would be the frame that is passed in. That would be and this register, um, and so on. In LLDB, fortunately, you can use the dollar sign arc one through arc six, and I think even more, but these are the ones that fit in registers and don't have to go on the stack. Um, you can use this as a shorthand. So it doesn't matter which architecture you're on. If you're working on iOS code, um, you might see different architectures if you're debugging in the simulator or an, on an Intel Mac or on a device. Uh, if you're running on an M1 Mac and iOS devices, you're, you're only using ARM and you don't need to concern yourself with this so much, but the, the labeled uh, shorthand arguments in LLDB are one through arc six should give you a really easy way to access these if you ever need to. There are other registers um, and some of these are reserved, depends on the architecture. Um, so that if you don't really usually need to use these when you're reverse engineering something, unless you dive in really, really deep, way deeper than I ever have. Uh, in that case, look up what exactly they do. Um, Apple has a list where they explain which registers they have reserved, what you should not use. Um, and there's uh, something similar for Intel also. Now, that was our basic aside about assembly and registers. As for debugging, uh, debugging is a fantastic way to do dynamic analysis of applications. You can do this with running applications and um, this is hard because there are protections that get in your way of this. On Mac, there's the system integrity protection, which is a security feature. It stops your Mac from easily being hijacked, um, but it can be a nuisance for reverse engineering. So you can disable this, but do it at your own risk. Uh, this can get really dangerous. So I advise you to use a virtual machine if you ever want to do something like this. Um, also, this is really helpful if you accidentally attach to a crucial process that is needed to run the OS, like a Windows server, then having a VM means you can just shut it down, but your main OS is still running. Uh, this does not work, unfortunately, to debug iOS apps on M1 Macs, um, at least as far as I've seen so far. On N1 Macs, we can now run iOS apps straight from the App Store, but this only works when system integrity protection is enabled. Um, and attaching a debugger to one of them only works when it's disabled, so it cannot work by default. Um, there are, in general, processes on a Mac that you can attach a debugger to even without system integrity protection being disabled. Uh, but all of the Apple processes that you might be interested in, you can only attach to when it's disabled. Um, you can just play around with it and see and try it out. Maybe you'll find one that you can analyze. So that was the Mac side. What about iOS? iOS is a little tricky uh, because iOS is very, very locked down and you need to run a process called debug server in order to uh, to be able to debug on an iOS device. 
Unfortunately, a jailbreak is required to do this. So this is a little tricky. I've never actually done this myself. Um, I always preferred static analysis instead. Um, debugging some other process that aren't yours. You can do this on the command line, which is quick and easy. You can just attach to a named process, um, like you've seen the example here on the side. You can also wait for applications to launch, basically very much like Xcode does it, but you don't have to start of Xcode and create an empty project for it. You can use the LLDB command line just like you would in Xcode. You can step through code, for instance, and you can set breakpoints. Now you can also use Xcode to do something like this. You can uh, use all of the features that you normally would, like enabling symbolic breakpoints with uh, the, the, the GUI for doing all of this. As you can see here on the right hand side, I'm using the arguments that I've told you before to stop at a private method inside of the AppKit framework. Uh, you use the debug menu in the main menu to attach, which means you can use your known environment, you can see context all of this, and you can even use the view hierarchy debugger that's included in Xcode. And this looks a little something like this. In Xcode, you can just create an empty project, name it whatever you like, uh, and then attach the debugger to any random process that, that, you, that you like. For example, calendar, as in this case. Of course, as explained, this only works when uh, system integrity protection is disabled, but it'll let you attach the debugger and then you can hold execution. Uh, you can use the view hierarchy debugger even to analyze the user interface. You can set breakpoints. Um, that's all going to work. The, the wire that you see here usually that displays the views and everything will only work if you have metal support, which might not work if it's in a virtual machine. But you can just check out how exactly they render a calendar. And uh, if you ever want to implement an interface like that yourself, you could learn a thing or two from this. Okay, disassembling. Disassembling is the process of reverse engineering binary files. Um, uh, this means you're doing static analysis, unlike the uh, dynamic analysis, which we just saw uh, uh, using LLDB and Xcode. So what does this mean? Basically, you can use LLDB again to load a binary and to um, disassemble a, a method which you'd like to see. Um, this is not very hard to do and you get a nice, nicely formatted um, output out of this. Now, Hopper. Hopper will give you um, a, a better way of handling these things. Hopper is um, a commercial third-party application, which is likely, I have not checked, but I assume it's named for Grace Hopper, um, an admiral which was one of the pioneers of um, computer science. Now, Hopper is a disassembler and debugging tool. Um, this means it can do a lot of the jobs that we've already seen, like LDB would, but it also does a little more. Um, it does disassembly and then some. It's highly customizable and scriptable. So the deeper you go into reverse engineering, the more you're gonna get uh, out of something out of a tool like Hopper. Um, it's available for Mac OS and Linux and licenses start at 99 euros as of today, um, which is relatively normal price for a tool such as this. Um, competing tools are, commercial competing tools are oftentimes a lot um, more expensive. And if you decide to look into Hopper, try to check out what kind of protection mechanism they use in this app to guard against reverse engineering because I thought that was quite clever. Now the alternatives, there are free and open source tools. Um, some of this, some of those are very interesting and they have uh, a bit of overlap with Hopper's um, 
um, um, feature set. Uh, there are also um, commercial ones, which are over a thousand euros for a single license. Um, so they can be really in, uh, expensive, uh, but they sometimes have a lot more very specific um, functionality that you might be missing in a tool like Hopper or open source comparisons. I tend to use Hopper because uh, I know it. Um, it works pretty well with um, most current Apple things um, some of the restrictions I'll get to in a moment um, and it gets updated quite quickly so it's been really important for me in the last few years to use this Hopper looks a little like something like this when you load it up um, this is Hopper with the app kit framework loaded. Um, as you can see, you get uh, the assembly that you want. You can also see on the left-hand side, you get a little more extra context and a bunch of other things. You got a Python shell at the bottom. Uh, I'm not gonna go too much into the details, but I'm gonna show you how exactly we're gonna use this um, as part of a real world example. So as I mentioned, I work at Sketch as a Mac engineer and um, at some time last year, we had a bug. And this bug was that when you were using the toolbar in text-only mode, which was still possible in Catalina back then, uh, a click on the insert button would not always bring up the menu. Sometimes it would, sometimes it wouldn't. And it fell on me to find out why this happened. And so um, I started debugging. I found out I found the stack trace for good cases and bad cases. I found out where they diverged because that would be my starting point um, for looking at this. So the method at fault I determined by this process was this private method in a private class in AppKit and it's toolbar item viewer track mouse for pop-up menu form representation for item for label view. In a good case, it would then lead to this method, pop-up menu form representation in label view. So what can go wrong in this method so we do not get to the good case? Let's take a look. You can load your library files or any other binary that you want to analyze and you're going to get um, a much easier way to look at the data there. Uh, you would do this the following way. You click on file, read executable, disassemble, and then select the library you want, in this case, AppKit. Click Open, then click OK. The default options are usually fine. And this will analyze um, the binary file that you give it. It's going to try to read all of the selector information. It's going to try to find um, all the information it can. And you're going to start here. We're, we're seeing some labels already, and it's going to do some more work here to analyze this. This is going to take a moment but I have a prepared version here of the AppKit binary. So now we can go ahead and look for the information we want. We want to analyze Anis Toolbar Item Viewer. We can already see we have a bunch of methods on, on this class here, and there's more other classes uh, with the same prefix, but we're interested in a method with track mouse and we have these two here this would be an toolbar item viewer track mouse for pop-up menu form representation and this is not the one we're looking for we're looking for and this toolbar item viewer track mouse for pop-up menu form representation for item for a label view this is the one that we want now inside of this method we're interested in finding the path that gets us to our success case and the path that gets us to our failure case. Um, we have the same view here that we have in the command line version, which means we can look at the complete disassembly um, of the method and draw our conclusions from there. But again, this is hard to read and hard to follow. So we have a little help here. These arrows help us to see where something jumps into this case, but an easier version is this. The control flow graph is going to show us 
um, in which cases we end up where. So we want to find um, the point where we get to a method. Is this the right one? This is the right one. The point where we get to a method called pop-up menu form representation in label view. At this point, we know that we're in the in the good case. Now, in the control flow graph, I selected this in this view, and then when I would switch to the control flow graph, it automatically gets me to the right point. I can see that we can that we only can get to this spot from here. Um, we don't know exactly which path is the bad one, so the bad one might as well take us through here as well. So let's see how we get here. We can get there, for instance, from here, and this looks really interesting because there's something going on um, here that we could check out more in depth. We can already get quite a bit of detail from this. For instance, we can see that we're dealing with an anise date um, with a time interval since now of 0.25 seconds. And then apparently we're waiting for an event in, in the run loop um, to come across. And um, we, we're using a mask to check for that. This is checking for the event type and it matches that um, uh, against, I think it was this value. Um, but we can probably see this better if we look into this mode, the pseudo probe mode. Now, here we can see that this is indeed 0x44 is the event mask. Um, and I checked this, it translates to NS event mask left mouse drag and NS event mask left mouse up. So this is waiting for an event where the mouse is either dragged or the button is released. And if this happens within 250 milliseconds from the invocation of this method, we go into a different path than when it happens later. So what happens here is that when this, when the mouse button is released within 250 milliseconds, then something happens that we're not dealing with, which means the standard target action mode of our class um, of, of our toolbar item is invoked. And that means the pop-up that the framework usually handles is not brought up automatically. So the fix for our problem is very likely that in the target and action for this class, we need to handle this case. So if someone clicks on there, we need to bring up the, the pop-up menu manually. And there's an API for that, the, and it turns out this was the fix for our bug in the end, and we're pretty happy with this. Now, if I had just debugged this in the Xcode debugger and stepped through the assembly, it would have been way more difficult and way more time intensive to figure this out. But thanks to Hopper in this view, I could get there pretty quickly. Now, uh, now we've seen what Hopper can do. Uh, as I mentioned, Hopper has a bunch of limitations. Those are especially seen in Big Sur because Big Sur, as opposed to the former version of the OS, uses a dynamic linker cache instead of separate binaries. What does this mean? This cache combines a whole bunch of frameworks and Hopper can now extract binaries from the cache. This wasn't the, the case during the first betas of Big Sur, but selector information might not re be readily available for all of the symbols inside of the frameworks. So if you're looking for a specific se framework, a uh, specific selector like we just saw in um, the demo, then you might not be able to define that. Sometimes you can try a different architecture because all of the frameworks are available or most of the frameworks are available both for Intel and ARM, uh, and then you're gonna get lucky. Um, but you might have to extract certain things from the linker cache yourself. Unfortunately, this tends to change relatively quickly. One such breaking point was beta 8 or beta 9 of the Big Sur release process. Um, so try to find the most current options because if I show you something now, it might be outdated tomorrow. If you have a working .hop file, which means you extracted one of those things in Hopper, and uh, um, it worked, then keep the .hop file around 
and that's going to keep working even as you update um, your your OS. Now, in iOS 14, this is very similar because iOS also uses the dynamic linker cache. In fact, it has for a much longer time than macOS. The extraction options also change all the time, sometimes even for point releases, not necessarily only for major releases. Uh, you should, should also research current extraction options if you're interested in um, analyzing frameworks such as UIKit. Um, one website I found uh, is this, which gives you an example of how to use DSC Extractor, which is available as open source from Apple uh, and is hopefully helpful there. And also, again, keep your .hop files around once you have them. Now, further information for all things debugging and reverse engineering, I found this book a really good guide um, as to how the whole process works. It goes into a lot more detail than this uh, talk. Um, it gives you a lot of background on LLDB, how you can use Python for these things. Um, it goes into dtrace and ptrace, um, mock o binaries, and it's it's generally a pretty good reference, even if it's been uh, if it's outdated just a bit. Um, it doesn't cover the dynamic linker cache on macOS, for instance. Um, there are a bunch of developers who who usually concern themselves with um, reverse engineering on an Apple platform with um, I, I, I have a list here of the ones that I follow among other things for these reasons because it's always nice to learn about these things if only to keep um, this kind of tool in your tool belt if you need it for debugging or for developing new features thank you for uh, listening to my talk um, and that's it that was it I hope you got something good out of this talk. I hope you have another tool that you can use for debugging now or for analyzing your apps for finding solutions that work for you. If you have any more questions, I'll be happy to answer them right now or on Twitter later on. Thanks.